into Surviving Paradise, the podcast that takes a sometimes serious, oftentimes humorous look at the claim by Jehovah's Witnesses that they are living in a modern day spiritual paradise hosted by nine kings in upstate New York. I am your host, Stacey Bauman, former elder, ministerial servant, and a little guy raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses in the 1970s and 1980s as I do a quick warning this is all about having fun maybe a little educational we try to heal each episode features sarcasm humor and my own brand of observation and experiences please note that while we may disagree it is never meant to offend anyone and everyone and another warning this week I'm going to give you two warnings in paradise I have no idea where I'm going with this subject (laughs) So welcome to my random stream of consciousness on a subject that has long fascinated me. I'm going to consider this more of a share this week, and I'm hoping that it will generate some conversations, some thoughts, and some feedback that is always welcome here. It's no secret that I was a kid in the 70s and 80s with a very healthy imagination who was regularly accused of overthinking, and boy, was I a daydreamer. I probably lost more sleep than most people, if I'm being honest, because I just can't stop thinking. I'm going to disclose something personal here. I've long been intrigued with the concept of time. As a kid, I was easily drawn into stories whose theme was all about time travel and how it impacted people's lives and how it changed futures and pasts and all that other good stuff. I can still remember the moment I discovered A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Langell in my junior high school library in the Bay Area in California. I've also watched the classic 1960 movie, The Time Machine, with Rod Taylor a few million times. I'm sure there's at least a few people out there that remember that movie. Boy, did it have some creepy monsters. So you can imagine how excited I was in the 80s to see Back to the Future in, actually it was 1985. I think it's safe to say that Back to the Future is considered somewhat of a classic, right? I mean, come on, it's a bit of a classic, at least in the sci-fi 80s genre, right? Who doesn't love Michael J. Fox as Marty McFly, the coolest name ever? (laughs) McFly? What? Remember he was ripping off guitar solos and not so subtly exploring the very Freudian awkwardness of having his own mother flirt with him when he arrived in the past. It was very weird, very Freudian now in hindsight. You remember she thought his name was Calvin Klein based on his underwear. That's what I remember. Hey Calvin, because of his underwear. Awkward. We got a DeLorean with cool doors. We got Christopher Lloyd as Doc Brown. We got a stereotypical bully named Biff. I mean Biff. Come on, it's brilliant. And then there's the weirdness of Crispin Glover as his nerdy dad. And actually a weird guy in everyday life. But more importantly to me, we have the never-ending questions regarding the concept of time in that movie including predestination, foreknowledge, and that little thing called free will. Albeit it's all wrapped up in a fun movie with Huey Lewis and the News singing about the power of love. I mean, come on. Back to the Future is a classic. It's a classic. And it fed into my interest in all things time. And despite being a cheesy movie with a cool car, uh, it really made me contemplate on a more serious stage, predestination, foreknowledge, and free will. Granted, it wasn't done in a serious scholarly way. Let's be honest, I was still a kid. But the messaging and the questions were there throughout the movie. And growing up as a Jehovah's Witness, the subject of predestination greatly intrigued me. As you might imagine, I had a few questions about it. (laughs) As I do, I have to offer the obvious This is a subject that impacts all religions, most especially and including Christianity. But this little show is about Jehovah's Witnesses. Just a reminder, I'm going to get out front of the inevitable messages I'm going to get on social media, YouTube, and the like. 
This shows about Jehovah's Witnesses and their views on predestination, foreknowledge, and free will. Look, it's also important to note that it's doubtful that I or anyone can do justice to this subject in just one episode, but I'm going to give it a shot. Again, I don't know where I'm going with this. It's more of a share this week. But the idea that Jehovah is all-knowing, all-seeing, and all-powerful, including his ability to foretell the future and control time itself, well, it, it created a real problem for me as a kid. Was I alone? Doubtful. The conversations in my head on this subject started early in my life. From as far back as I can remember, I was learning terms like the Almighty and All-Powerful and Perfect. We've got an episode on that. When it comes to Jehovah as a personage, as a personality, which only added to my confidence that somehow, somehow, I still can't explain it, I was lucky enough to be in the only true religion on earth and by extension in the universe run by the only true God that I knew of. Wow, was I lucky. Did anybody else have this thought as a kid, a realization? And I'll tell you, for a boy with an overactive imagination and a classic overthinker, my mind was fertile soil for questions on this subject. Lots and lots of questions, all of which were never answered. <laughs> and I'm not going to hear say I have any answers today, at least not to my satisfaction. In full disclosure, as I was thinking about this subject this week, one thing really jumped out at me. Despite every Christian religion, including our Jehovah's Witnesses, taking a stab at explaining some of the stuff I'm about to share, there is one thing that is painfully obvious to me. And yes, it's a bold statement in my opinion. No one can still answer this stuff. And there it is. No one can answer it. Not in satisfactory terms. Remember, it all comes from the mindset and the limited knowledge of other people, guys, men, with their own perceptions and limitations. No one has an answer to this stuff, in my opinion. And to take it a step further, I believe the only answer is actually an obvious one. I'll put it out there as a possibility. And that is because men, other men, with their limited ability during their limited time on this planet are actually the ones that created all of this and the concept, including the character of Jehovah himself. And they have no way of explaining their open-ended stories surrounding all of it. They just don't, my opinion. I liken the writers of the Bible a lot to the two guys that wrote Game of Thrones. For anybody that might have watched that show, by the way, it was fantastic the first four seasons. It was a great concept, and it was an incredible story. It was mind-bending. Until they had to start coming up with answers at the end for all the different scenarios and characters. Then, well, you got Danny going nuts for no reason and killing everybody. You got Jon Snow, who had a hero's arc, turning into a pansy, just repeating, she's my queen, she's my queen every few seconds, and no answers to so many questions revolving around the story. The Game of Thrones died a whimper. <laughs> but time, time, and the guy, eh, let's say God, that created it, and his ability to bend it, but he doesn't really want to but he can, but he doesn't. Buckle in. Sort of like Marty McFly climbing into the DeLorean with Doc Brown. Let's start with Jehovah himself and his own comments on time and how it impacts a conversation on predestination, foreknowledge, and that little thing we're told we all have, free will. I'm going to share what I learned as a little guy inside Jehovah's Witnesses and why it created a boatload of questions for me personally. I think it's important to point out that creating time and all that comes with it is the very first thing any of us ever learned about Jehovah. 
you remember. In Genesis 1-1 of the New World Translation, we are told, quote, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, end quote. Beginning. End. Time. Wow. There was no beginning or time or future before this or before us. Apparently, when Jehovah made the sun and realized he would have a bunch of kids on a planet he had not yet made, by the way, I mean, the angels don't need time, right? They don't. And that word apparently is going to come up again. Jehovah made Jesus. Jesus made everything else, including time or the concept of time or things that revolved around time. But that is just the, quote, beginning of so many questions and undeniable facts when considering Jehovah's Witnesses and their belief system. Consider what he says at an all-important scripture to this conversation at Isaiah 46 and verse 10 of the New World Translation. Jehovah himself gives it to us bluntly. He is the keeper and bender of time including how it may impact a Jehovah's Witness in this very second. And by extension, let's be honest, it impacts the entire human race. Isaiah 46.10 says this, quote, From the beginning, I foretell the outcome, and from long ago the things that have not yet been done. I say, my decision will stand and I will do whatever I please, end quote. Isaiah 46.10. Not a lot of wiggle room in there, right? Taking the Bible, including everything I mentioned after this, at face value, it makes clear that Jehovah knows everything before it happens. And even though we are involved in his original purpose, he is going to do, quote, whatever he pleases, end quote. But let's make this more personal. Let's ask the question from the outset. Are you and I predestined? How long has Jehovah known me or us? I think it's a legitimate question and one I had as a kid. Incidentally, he gives us the answer in his instruction book. At Psalms 139, verses 13 and 16, again quoting the New World Translation, courtesy of the governing body, we get this, quote, For you produced my kidneys. You kept me screened off in my mother's womb. Your eyes even saw me as an embryo. All its parts were written in your book. End quote. Thank you, King David, for cluing us in. Got it. You have known me since conception. But, according to Isaiah 46.10 that we just read, you knew me even before that. Sure makes pediatricians who can see the sex of your baby or any birth defects on an ultrasound eh, seem like quasi-amateurs, doesn't it? And yet, with that knowledge... Coupled with your many prophecies and the publications of the governing body, you know, foretelling the future that I can read in the Bible, it only leads me to more questions about my mapped out future and your use of foreknowledge, predestination, and the like. For example, again, thoughts from this podcast host. Why doesn't he know where his Israelite babies are in Egypt? Why did he have blood splattered on the doors so his angels didn't accidentally kill babies? Doesn't he see embryos? Doesn't he know where we are? Why did he need to do this? Are not the babies in their cribs? <laughs> okay, I'll stay on track here. Question for another day. But incidentally... He apparently likes to be very tight-lipped about the timing of anything in the future. We've already seen that he known us in the past, way before we even come into existence, but he also doesn't like to share much about the future. Even if it is the day he has marked on some celestial calendar to kill everyone on the planet 
that doesn't recognize Jehovah's Witnesses. Make no mistake, that's their message. So tight is he with that day to remember that he didn't even tell his own son, Jesus Christ, who, let's be honest, technically is actually the creator of time and space. Am I the only one that sees a problem there? So many questions. From Matthew 24 and verse 36 of the New World Translation, we get, quote, Concerning that day and hour, nobody knows, neither the angels of the heavens, nor the Son, but only the Father. End quote. Seems reasonable, right, when considering time, Jehovah, and everything that surrounds it? In fact, the very same chapter of the Bible reads as Jesus reminding us about a certain guy in the past. You remember, that guy had an ark, he had some animals, and then it started raining and raining and raining, and the story ends with everybody drowning. <laughs> Jehovah didn't tell them what day that was happening either. But if you're paying attention, the God of time apparently knew no one would listen to Noah anyway, because the proof is in the pudding. He only had Noah build the ark to a certain dimension. That's odd if you don't already foretell the future, people aren't predestined, and you don't know how they're going to react to Noah's message. He had him build it to a certain dimension that was only enough to carry eight people and, of course, the animal kingdom and their poop. Had Noah been paying attention, he may have been clued into that fact and he may have realized that he was wasting his time preaching. No one was going to listen to him anyway. Jehovah only had the ark made to a certain size. Apparently, Jehovah chose to predestine and foretell how successful Noah would be before it started raining. The great timekeeper was dropping a few clues, but none of them were about when everybody exactly was going to be drowned. And you knew if you were on this show that I'd sneak Noah in somehow. <laughs> and despite promising to never do that again, the whole flood thing, he has taken Jehovah's Witnesses standing next to book carts filled with books that all point to a future date that makes the flood look like a swim party a date he plans on killing everything and everyone that doesn't obey Stephen Let David Splain and the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. That's the message, plain and simple. We know that Jehovah is in control because, well, eh, he created everything, especially Jesus, who then created everything else including the celestial bodies, including the concept by extension of time. At Colossians 1, 16 and 17 of the New World Translation, we're told, quote, because by means of him, all other things were created in the heavens and on the earth, the things visible and the things invisible, time, tick, 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 whether they are thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, all other things have been created through him and for him. Also, he is before all other things, and by means of him, all other things were made to exist. End quote. Jehovah and Jesus, the great timekeepers, but most especially Jesus, according to Colossians 1. And this is only emphasized by the fact that as a young Jehovah's Witness, we were taught that Jehovah himself is in fact timeless. He has always been, and he will always be. Jehovah transcends time. If you're thinking about it in human terms, he is outside of time. It's a brain bender. It still keeps me up at night. Everything we know, including our talks, our, excuse me, our clocks, <laughs> tick-tocking that is, could go bye-bye, they could disappear, but none of that impacts Jehovah because he created Jesus who created the concept of time. So fine, there it is, we've established it. He controls time, he can bend time, he can make time go away. 
and more important to anyone listening, Jehovah and his son can see the future, the past, and anything else our minds can think of. No wonder living forever on a paradise earth doesn't seem to be a big deal to them, right? Forever is just a concept used to explain to us lowly humans. They understand it. They live it. Was I the only kid who spent many sleepless nights trying to figure out how it was that he has always existed? How he will always exist? What he was doing before making Jesus? What was he doing in the dark before making light? Did anybody else have these questions? Because they came to me at a very young age. And as I mentioned at the outset, no good answers right up to today. And while I have always been intrigued with this subject, going back to the beginning, see what I did there, as I aged, got baptized and became an elder who had to have more mature thought processes and teach other people, I only became more intrigued with how all of this related to the future including what it said about the God of Jehovah's Witnesses himself. And I know that's a subject I revisit a lot on this show because I think it's pertinent to a Jehovah's Witness. Naturally, when something good or bad happens, we humans made in his image are going to wonder why. It's my favorite question, as you likely know. He, though, could see it coming, and as we will soon see, he even causes it to happen. And I have to ask at this point, is that not predestination? Am I predestined? Is my fate chosen? Does anything matter? Do my decisions matter? Am I making my own decisions? You know, that whole free will thing. Who needs a time machine going forward or even backward if Jehovah is controlling all of it anyway. All of this should, in my opinion, that's all this is, welcome to the stream of consciousness, all of it should get a few minutes of consideration from all Jehovah's Witnesses. Most humans consider making their own decision a right. And wait for it, we get a lot of mixed messages from the God that created time, and as always, most of them come from his instruction manual known as the Bible, or by extension, his organization, led by the Nine Kings in upstate New York, as they desperately try to explain all of this. The governing body simply cannot explain why Yahweh of the Bible, Jehovah is not his name, folks, tells us he has already seen the future and that he can do whatever he wants and at the same time tell us we aren't predestined, that we actually have a choice. And believe me, I want to discuss exactly what that choice is, but when you dig into their literature and their explanation of Jehovah's statements on time, that literature presents Jehovah as nothing short of a flake, a flaky God who plays favorites, he keeps secrets, and in the end, he relinquishes control of space and time on occasion. And worse, according to Isaiah 46.10, which we've read, he does what he wants anyway, which means he sure likes watching people suffer. Because of this what he likes, there's been centuries of people in misery. And I fully realize a Jehovah's Witness right now is a washing cognitive dissonance and will easily dismiss that statement. Then they'll go to the Watchtower study and they'll read the following. The Watchtower of 2008, October 1st, pages 3 and 4, Who Can Know the Future, is the article. We get this, quote, What makes God different? He completely understands everything he has created, including the nature and inclination of man. When he chooses to do so, God can foresee exactly how individuals and entire nations will act. Further, he has un- 
limited ability to control the outcome of events. End quote. Wow. A Jehovah's Witness will raise their hand and answer the question in that paragraph that goes with that paragraph, and then mostly will go back to sleep there in the kingdom hall. But if you're keeping track at home and you're giving this any thought, any focus, your child is essentially about to run out into the street after the ball. You can stop him, but hey, you gave that kid free will. Let him make the decision to run after the ball or not out into the street. Did I mention that the car coming down the street is driven by a guy that the father actually knows personally and the driving the guy driving that car told the father that he actually likes running over kids at high speeds inside his car does that not describe how jehovah used his foreknowledge to potentially predestine adam and eve oh and all the rest of us by extension before you become indignant with me, or perhaps you're a Jehovah's Witness growing increasingly uncomfortable with this episode and this question, rest assured, you're not alone. And you were, as am I, made in his image. So the question itself is okay. He created us to ask these kinds of questions, according to the Bible and the governing body. Oh, and the governing body themselves have desperately tried to explain this stuff for people who actually think it through. Let me give you some examples. From the Watchtower of 1998, April 15th, pages 5 through 8, What Will Your Future Be? is the article. We are told this, quote, So did Jehovah foreknow and even decree Adam's fall into sin, as well as the calamitous consequences that this would bring upon the human family? What we have considered shows that this cannot be true. What is more, if God did foreknow all of this, he would have become the author of sin when he made man, and God would be deliberately responsible for all human wickedness and suffering. Clearly, this cannot be reconciled with, with, God, with what God reveals about himself in the scriptures. End quote. <laughs> okay. From the Watchtower of 2011, January 1st, pages 13 through 15, did God know that Adam and Eve would sin is the article? A great question I've had since I was very young. It tells us this, quote, if God truly had foreknown that this perfect couple would sin, what would this imply? Such a notion would attribute many negative traits to God. He would seem to be unloving, unjust, and insincere. Some might label it cruel to expose the first humans to something that was foreknown to end badly. God might seem responsible for, or at least an accomplice to, all the badness and suffering that followed throughout history. To some, our creator would even appear foolish." End quote. And with both of those quotes, please feel free to rewind and re-listen. I only say, yeah, exactly. Somebody else was thinking about this, as was I. We just read in the Watchtower that he has unlimited ability to control the outcome of events. So we either have questions about Jehovah, or... If we're being honest, we probably have questions about the men that may have created Jehovah in the Bible. Would you say that's reasonable? You know, authors that don't understand space and time any more than you and I might, but they took a stab at explaining the God that created it all. Is it possible that they are the reason for this confusion? Men writing this person, this character, and not being able to explain the loopholes, see Game of Thrones, Back to the Future, and other men who wrote such movies. Jehovah's Witnesses are taught that Jehovah himself turns his ability to see the future kind of on and off, like a light switch, or as you'll see, a radio. <laughs> Why? 
Because the governing body says so. It's their explanation for what seems obvious. Jehovah can see the past. He can see the future. He can control this. He could have avoided all this, but he didn't. And we get to pay the price. Couldn't be an explanation created by men, right? And for me, I found myself spending way too much time wondering, at what point during the garden party back in Eden did Jehovah just check out and decide not to know what was about to happen, uh, forcefully pushing Adam and Eve and all creation by turning away and not looking into something considered as predestination and ultimately destruction? Is the Father, the Creator, off the hook? If he decides to just kind of look away so he doesn't have to see what the child decides about running out into the street for the ball, even when he knows about a guy that likes to run kids over, what? <laughs> Is it okay? Does he bear no responsibility if he controls space and time but just decides not to? Let's let the governing body answer on what it means to see trouble coming and just decide to ignore it. From Bible Teachings, Bible Questions Answered on the website, we are told this, quote, The Bible also describes sins of omission, that is, failing to do what is right, from James 4.17, end quote. Jehovah wouldn't do that, would he? Decide to look away, when he can control space and time, predestination, foreknowledge of badness coming. If he just looks away, he's not, you know, being irresponsible, is he? They continue to try to answer this about their God. From the Watchtower of 1984, March 1st, pages 3 through 4, the article Man's Inhumanity to Man features this spiritual nugget. Quote, however, there are sins of omission as well as capacity of commission. Inhumanity can reveal itself by simply turning a blind eye to those in trouble. In a recent test case in South Africa, a woman lay motionless beside her car on the edge of a highway to see if anyone would stop and help. No one did in two days. <laughs> End quote. It seems as though the governing body understands Someone who can control badness from happening, but decides to look away and let it happen anyway. I don't know about you, but if you're watching one of your spiritual kids, let's check that. Let's call it spirit kids. Crawl into a snake with the end result being death and mayhem to billions on into the future. I don't know. Maybe you could consider stopping him. Maybe. No, let's let him drive down that street running over not only your first kid, but all the other kids. The kids get to make their own decisions after all, and that will show those kids and everyone watching who's boss. You're the boss. You need to answer that whole universal sovereignty question. And a very loving use, might I add, of your all-powerful foreknowledge. How does the governing body explain all of this to Jehovah's Witnesses, you ask? Let's take their own words for it. Watchtower, 2006, June 1st, pages 21 through 25. Jehovah tells from the beginning, the finale. Quote, Jehovah, apparently, <laughs> chose not to foresee what Adam and Eve would do even though he has the ability to know everything in advance, end quote. So if you're a witness or a former witness, and this has always troubled you, the governing body's explanation is, apparently, <laughs> apparently Jehovah just chose to look away. <laughs> My first question is, really guys in New York, did Jehovah tell you that? I did send you a message to let you know he looked away because by looking away, all of human history has been impacted. And I guess that solves the biggest issue man has ever faced, right? Apparently. 
Jehovah decided to look away as the kid ran into the street because that's how Jehovah rolls. And if that didn't convince you or lay your mind at ease, putting a stop to the mind-bending questions, how about an illustration from the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses and his organization? From the Awake of 1983, January 8th, pages 14 through 16, under the article, Are Our Lives Predestined? Great question. We get this quote. The Creator does not fix or foreordain the path each individual will take. Does this conflict with God's ability to see into the future? No. To illustrate, <laughs> sorry, to illustrate, a radio enables one to hear world news in the home, but it must first be switched on and the right station selected at the correct time. Likewise, with the Creator's power of foreknowledge, He makes discretionary and selective use of it, showing regard for the free will He gave to man." End quote. What a beautiful illustration from the governing body, and I feel better already, not really. And that clears it up, right? When it comes to Jehovah and how he deals with our lives yesterday, today, and tomorrow, Jehovah's like a radio. Makes sense, right? A couple more questions, dear governing body. Who made the radio? Does he just turn the station if he doesn't like the song? You know, sort of like relating it to ignoring wars where people are being just killed and destroyed, future catastrophes that take lives, stuff like that. No answer. You can't answer that. He just decided to look away. He turned the station. Just a neat illustration that makes no sense. It sounds good at a Watchtower study though, right? Got it. One last question. Can I get his Spotify playlist? <laughs> I'm real curious what's on it. Does he like Pink Floyd? I don't know. <laughs> the governing body goes out of its way to say Jehovah's Witnesses are not predestined. And Jehovah has very selective foreknowledge. And it's all in conflict with his favorite book, the very instruction manual he gave to us. But they teach millions, if not billions of people, that Jehovah doesn't use his foreknowledge unless he just kind of wants to. He just as he wants to. You know, like Doc Brown in Back to the Future. He apparently decided to sit out a few things, including what... I would say is billions of those precious little kids running out into traffic to get that ball. He just decided to look away. He's selective, like turning a radio station away. If you're now saying, uh, oh, okay, I mean, this is in the watch, it's in print, it's in the buy, I got it, but can I ask an additional question? Why? 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 <laughs> Like, couldn't he have just created us to all be super happy and procreate and inhabit an entire universe and all have animals and fuzzy things and, and, and just live a life of endless happiness? I mean, he wanted kids, apparently. He was completely self-contained, but he made Jesus, then he made us. So, you know, why? Why? Folks, I said it at the outset of this episode. I, I got no answers, so I'm going to encourage you to move on. The answer, according to the governing body, the nine guys he speaks to, is uh, because, or as you can see, apparently, <laughs> which gives any thinking Jehovah's Witness all sorts of additional confidence when it comes to other things these guys say that they t attempt to explain. Just, just slide in, apparently. You know, things like, I don't know, your salvation. The, their claim that he chose them in 1919 to be his guys, or why he made all kinds of blood types but doesn't want us to use blood to help or save each other. The answer? The answer according to the governing body on all things time, foreknowledge, free will, and predestination is apparently. And for years, I found myself wishing those guys in upstate New York would just shut the hell up. Just humbly admit that we, and really they, 
have no clue how any of this works. They can't explain space and time. They can't explain why Jehovah's like a radio. They can't explain why you watch your kids run out into the street because you can't handle a bully. They can't do any of it. But they're going places after all. Their thrones are getting cold in heaven. Allegedly. Or, or should I say, uh, apparently. <laughs> but then they like to claim, those of us that want to think it all through, uh, just a few extra steps, are just missing the obvious. And well, I have to say here at this point, I think they're missing a few things themselves. Who writes these articles trying to explain this first? But it's clear that foreknowledge and predestination are actually two different things, even if they closely relate to one another. But still, they claim things like the following in their literature. It's in print. The Watchtower of 1998, April 15th, pages 5 through 8, the series, What Will Your Future Be?, gives us this, quote, All the arguments in support of predestination are based on the supposition that since God undeniably has the power to foreknow and determine future events, he must foreknow everything, including the future actions of every individual. Is that supposition sound, however? What God reveals in his holy scriptures indicates otherwise, end quote. To that I say, does it? Does it? Jehovah may decide to look away under the gift of respecting our free will. However, even if Jehovah decides to look away from the incoming wreck, death, and mayhem, his very action of doing so dooms us to a predestined outcome. It's my assertion. Does any thinking person believe that a father that turns the other way, looks away as his kid chases a ball into the street, bears no responsibility? Knowing what's going to happen to that kid? By looking away when he can't save us the misery and injury, is he not predestining that child to tragedy? And whether you believe any of this or not, it's your right. This is only a convo. That is one strange thing for an almighty God, Jehovah, to do. Especially when Jehovah's Witnesses are taught that his very name means he causes to become. Ironic? Not to mention he is called the God of love. Just look away. Don't cause it to become. Don't save your kid. Don't save the misery. Is the decision itself not predestined? And look, I know for a fact I wasn't alone in contemplating such things. <laughs> Overactive head, I know. Would you like the proof that the governing body suffers from cognitive dissonance themselves, especially on this subject? Check this out. From the Awake of February 2009, pages 12 through 13, in the article, Is Your Future Predestined? Damn good question. We get this, quote, On the other hand, if God predetermines everything, including every nasty accident and vile deed that has ever happened, could we not rightly blame him for all the misery and suffering in the world? Thus, upon closer inspection, the teaching of predestination does not honor God, but casts a pall over him. It paints him as cruel, unjust, and unloving. End quote. Yes, 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 that, that right there. Exactly. And I would add, does the fact that he just turns away so he doesn't have to take responsibility and see what's about to happen, because he can if he wants to, does that free him of any responsibility? Does that not make him cruel, unjust, and unloving? But for those brave enough to not turn that radio dial on this episode already, Consider one of my all-time favorite scriptures when it comes to random thoughts on predestination and foreknowledge. And I must say this bluntly. 
take this scripture and my own thoughts on it at face value, in context. At John 6.44, this is a verse that has puzzled me forever. We are told this, quote, No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will resurrect him on the last day. End quote. I'm going to say here there's been lots of write-ups on this, but these are my thoughts. And now for my questions that have spanned decades on that verse. I'm getting back into that DeLorean with Marty McFly right now. John 6.44 in Predestination has been examined by many, many scholars. You can find conflicting views and opinions everywhere. There are mountains of opinions on this one statement and whether Jesus' words prove that people are predestined for salvation. And the debate goes back centuries and incidentally, it even predates the mouthpiece of God himself, Chuck Taze Russell, who himself, I guess, was drawn to Jehovah, right? And you can see this particularly in John Calvin's theory on predestination all the way back in the 16th century using John 6.44. Apologists will say, well, you know, Jehovah may tap someone on the shoulder and invite them to become a Jehovah's Witness, but they have to choose to do it. Ah, yes, free will. Got it. But folks, this only creates many more questions, in my mind at least, all centered around foreknowledge, predestination, and Jehovah once again. This text also touches on the question of predestination, the idea that God is the one who ultimately decides which person is saved and which person is destroyed. And here, the language seems fairly specific, even in the context of the whole chapter. Only those drawn by God can come to Christ. It's all about free will, but only after he draws you. <laughs> right? Huh? Jesus didn't say that, folks. Take the verse at face value. You get free will, but only after he's decided to draw you. And boy, do I have some questions. First, a Jehovah's Witness will tell you that Jehovah observes someone throughout their life. And he decides if he likes them or not, basically. And uh, I would say, well, sorry, but that's not true. Dear Jehovah's Witness, brave enough to listen, it's simply not true. We've already established that Jehovah sees us as embryos, as little, barely developed fetuses. In fact, using the Bible, if you read it, he can see us before we are even created at all, at conception. See the many prophecies, naming names. Does he already know who he likes enough to draw to him? And if he does, is that not plain in a world known as predestination? It's worth a conversation. For proof, what exactly did the babies that drowned during the flood do to justify killing them with all the other adults? If Jehovah, you know, hadn't looked into their futures already. Did they just poop their cloth diapers too much so they got to die too? Because there was no lifetime. There was no evidence for him to look at to draw them. Jehovah had told Noah the flood was coming 120 years in advance. Many babies born in the final years that got to be drowned were, uh, they were predestined to die. <laughs> there was no chance. Were those babies not drawn so Jesus will resurrect them on the last day, according to John 6.44? Seems pretty obvious that Noah never conducted a Bible study with them. He didn't have a Bible after all. So the idea that a baby could have been drawn to Jehovah is absurd. It couldn't have been possible. So uh, Were they predestined to die? Because die they did. Why does Jehovah draw so few people today in 2024 in places like Pakistan or China 
Why doesn't he draw more people, according to John 644, from North Korea? <laughs> Some of the most populous places on earth. And so few, if any, people that Jehovah apparently wants to draw to him. So if you're born in one of those countries, are you not predestined to doom, according to Jehovah's Witnesses? And if you're saying, ah, he can resurrect them, subject for another day and lots of past episodes, he can resurrect them, well, so God just kills them just to wake them up again? Lots of questions. How about a second one? All of this, and this is less of a question than a statement, all of this type of thinking feeds into the Jehovah's Witness belief system. To be in a kingdom hall or in a Bible study, to actually land one of those illustrious Bible studies with their publications, means that Jehovah was looking around the planet. He, he took a break from keeping the sun in the sky and he went, oh, look at that person over there. I like you a lot. And he's going to draw you. So he does that today, according to the governing body, by sending a Jehovah's Witness to your door. Or maybe they just smiled a little extra long and you walked up to one of their book carts. That's how he draws you. It also gives a Jehovah's Witness the belief that Jehovah is using them personally to draw people. Once again, calling into question the passivity of an almighty father that somehow or for some reason needs imperfect humans to get his message across on all things life or death to the planet. And at that point, I would say, I sure hope those imperfect people he's using to draw people are really good and gifted communicators, right? Because if they're not, eh, so sorry. For a Jehovah's Witness listening, I have a challenge and a bit of a question for you. How adept are you at explaining overlapping generations or 607 BCE if I walk up to you today and ask you about them in front of your book card? Jehovah's apparently using you to draw people, forget the foreknowledge or predestination. He's depending on you to communicate clearly. He's drawing them, after all. And if you don't communicate clearly and you can't answer my challenge and question about those subjects, well, somebody dies. Jehovah, according to John 6.44, and this whole subject matter is depending on a Jehovah's Witness to cut that coffee break short, put down that scone and black coffee, and get back out in front of that cart. You may have noticed people are very drawn to them. <laughs> and so if Jehovah is drawing people, I mean, I could go down a rabbit hole and I kind of am. Why is field service a thing? Why do we even need it? Is it necessary? All those meetings, those car groups, the mountains of publications, the old territory maps some of us remember. Is that really the only way Jehovah can draw people in the 20th and 21st centuries? And getting back to the subject at hand, uh, what did he see in their future? What did he see about them? And why isn't everybody in that bucket if we all got free will? You can only come to him if he draws you personally. And how about a third point? How about the fact that Jehovah, the God of foreknowledge and prophecy, has uh, himself gotten involved with bending time by influencing people to do things his way as he, in fact, draws them to him? Even the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses realizes this is a thing. From the Awake of 1998, February 8th, pages 13 through 15, Does Christian Unity Allow for Variety, is the article? We're told this. Pay close attention. Quote, At John 6, 44, there's my verse, Jesus explained, No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. The verb used here does not suggest that God drags people against their will. Instead, God gently attracts, appealing to the heart. There is, as one Bible scholar put it, 
an influence from God to incline the mind to believe. The Creator does not view the human family as a faceless mass. He makes an evaluation of individuals and gently draws to himself those who have a heart that is rightly disposed. End quote. There, the governing body admits and tries to explain, let's just highlight that, that Jehovah influences minds. What? I guess that free will thing just took a back seat, huh? And that's just for the people he wants anyway. How about those he told us would be coming? You know, the bad guys. He told us about a lot of bad guys and, you know, in the past, speaking of the future by means of prophecy, then admits in his book that he actually played a role in influencing them to do bad things. <laughs> what? It's a fascinating subject and a fascinating attempt by the governing body to try to explain things they can't explain. God can influence people. God sees people in the past. He sees them in the future. He causes things to become. He makes things, uh, you know, turn out the way he wants them to turn out. And then, of course, I yeah, gave us free will, too. Huh? And I give you now at this point an example that is a doozy, at least in my opinion, and there's plenty to unpack here. We don't have time. Well, look no further than one of the best bad guys ever, Judas Iscariot, one of Jesus' apostles. A Jehovah's Witness can arguably, and so they've been taught, that's really what we highlight here by the governing body, they can go all the way back to Genesis 3.15 and start asking questions on things like predestination and foreknowledge. But for fun, let's put that aside, and let's just start with Judas, handpicked by Jesus to be one of his original 12 apostles. Pretty important role. The governing body in 2024 says those 12 were the original governing body. And well, there is no easy way to say this, but the inventor of time himself Jesus Christ, he knew that Judas was a bad guy from the beginning, dooming not only Jesus' future on a torture stake, but dooming Judas. We call that predestination. In John 6, 64 of the New World Translation, we are told this, quote, But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning, those who did not believe and the one who would betray him. End quote. Judas Iscariot, Jesus knew. According to the governing body, this was all prophesied by King David in the Psalms as well. I'm not going to go there. They're there. But uh, we're told that Judas was acting on his own with free will. Boy, do I have some questions. Why did Jesus choose him? Didn't he have to choose him after all? Does Jesus get sold out to the Romans, actually to the Jews, then to the Romans, and sacrifice his life for us, making Judas and his decisions all predestination? Didn't it guarantee that Judas would be there to betray him? Nah. No. Not according to the nine kings in upstate New York that know more than you and I. And their attempt at an explanation is just plain bizarre. From the Watchtower of 1984, July 15th, pages 4 through 7, Has God Decided Your Fate? We are told this, quote, But what of Judas Iscariot? Was not the traitorous course of one of Jesus' disciples clearly prophesied in advance? Yes. But the prophesy, excuse me, got to nail this, but the prophecies did not specify which disciple would be the betrayer. <laughs> Indeed, the Watchtower of 84, July 15th, tells us this, quote, But what of Judas Iscariot? Was not the traitorous course of one of Jesus' disciples clearly prophesied in advance? Yes. 
but the prophecies did not specify which disciple would be the betrayer. Indeed, what if Jesus had known that Judas would be the betrayer? Then Jesus appointing Judas as an apostle would have made him a sharer in that betrayer's sins. God himself would also be an accomplice, since Jesus preceded his selection of Judas with a fervent prayer to Jehovah. End quote. Folks, I just read John 6.64 for a reminder. It says this, quote, For Jesus knew from the beginning those who did not believe and the one who would betray him. End quote. This is a classic example of the governing body doing some sort of a bait and switch. I don't know what you would call this. They're literally telling Jehovah's Witnesses to pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Jesus did know. It's in the Bible. They're saying Jesus didn't know which disciple, so it made it all okay. Eh, but he did. And so did Jehovah, because he helped him pick Judas. Did the governing body just dance around a question they can't answer? Jesus said he knew who he was, and he chose him anyway. In fact, for those of us who love this old time travel, predestination, foreknowledge subject, he had to. He had to make the prophecy come true. If he didn't choose Judas, setting the whole betrayal in motion and the sacrifice that leads to your and I hope for the future, none of this happens. And Jehovah is a God with questionable foreknowledge. Anybody else have a headache? Look, I couldn't follow Back to the Future parts two through four either. Those movies were weirder. <laughs> but the Watchtower of 84 continues. It says this, quote, Nevertheless, Jehovah was not ignorant of Satan's designs. He knew that Satan the devil had previously used a man's close friend as a betrayer, as he had done in the case of David's friend Ahithophel. End quote. What does this have to do with this subject? This is what the governing body does to their people. Back to the quote. Therefore, it was Satan, not God, who put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray Jesus Christ. Rather than resisting satanic influence, Judas allowed sin to gain the mastery over him. And at some point, Jesus was able to read Judas' heart and therefore foretell his betrayal. End quote. Folks, it was foretold centuries earlier. Folks, Jesus knew who Judas was, according to John 6.64. Nonetheless, what does the governing body try to do? What do they mean at some point? Jesus knew from the beginning. This is one example in the Holy Book. And time doesn't permit me to dig into Cyrus or Jehovah talking about hardening people's hearts or how just whacking Satan in the beginning would have settled any and all issues. Why were they questioning the Almighty anyway? And the only message all the other angels needed to witness and ever needed. It's an insane bending of time and space. Instead of just saying, yeah, none of it makes any sense. You've got an almighty God. He can foresee the future. He can help his kids from running into the street. And when it comes to Judas Iscariot as an example, had Jesus not assigned him as an apostle, what happens? What if not only did he know he was going to do it, it had been foretold, but he also goes on to say here in their explanation, and I'm sorry, I'm getting wound up, that Jesus was able to read his heart and Judas just gave in to Satan. What happens if he didn't? What happens if Judas just used his free will and never gave in to Satan? Even though he already had, it was predestined. I, on and on it goes. Get yourself some Tylenol. And we've considered all of this type of time-traveling, predestination, foreknowledge stuff before. It starts early in the journey of a Jehovah's Witness and for any Christian. There were two people and a garden party. They were perfect. Perfect bodies, perfect food, perfect home. And who doesn't like walking around in the nude eating snacks? I do. 
too much information. How did that work out? Jehovah drew them to him. Not sure they had much of a choice, by the way. There was only them. I guess they were person number one and two. And then Jehovah showed them a shiny new ball, told them they couldn't play with the shiny new ball, watched them as they grabbed the ball and played catch, and then watched on as they rolled the ball they shouldn't have ever seen nor played with, nor was even necessary to their lives, but he gave to them. He watched them roll it out into the street where a bad guy who Jehovah had also created and apparently drew to him hurt them. But Jehovah just chose to turn away, folks, and look the other direction. That's the answer the governing body is giving mankind. Just one example of how Jehovah and his son are explaining things to Jehovah's witnesses. Apparently. But rest assured, you should obey them. You should believe everything they say, even if none of it makes any sense. Kind of like this. Granted, I feel an overwhelming need to almost apologize. This is a long, rambling episode that, as you can tell, I still haven't made sense of. And it was never meant to arrive at a conclusion. This subject is merely to generate some thoughts and conversation. We're left with some simple facts on foreknowledge, predestination, and all things free will. And it comes to us courtesy of the Nine Kings in upstate New York. From the book Draw Close to Jehovah, page 178, we're told this, quote, Does this mean, though, that God has already foreseen the choices you will make in life? Some who preach the doctrine of predestination insist that the answer is yes. However, that notion actually undermines Jehovah's wisdom, for it implies that he cannot control his ability to look into the future. To illustrate, if you had a singing voice of unparalleled beauty, would you then have no choice but to sing all the time? <laughs> the notion is absurd. So is the illustration. Likewise, Jehovah has the ability to foreknow the future, but he does not use it all the time. To do so might infringe upon our own free will, a precious gift that Jehovah will never revoke. Worse yet, the very notion of predestination suggests that Jehovah's wisdom is cold, devoid of heart, feeling, or compassion. But nothing could be further from the truth. End quote. With that, the governing body is apparently telling Jehovah's Witnesses that God is a lot like Taylor Swift. She is really talented, but it's not like she walks around singing all the time. <laughs> She chooses to take a break from singing every now and then and eat a hamburger. What? <laughs> you are the Almighty. You can foresee the future. You can foresee the past. You can guarantee that your children are never harmed. That they live a life of unending happiness and deep appreciation and love for you. But you just look away. That's the explanation. I just looked away so they can choose to chase the ball out into the street or not. By the way, I gave them the ball. If you think about it long enough, it's disturbing. And by the way, about the choice, the choice on this whole free will thing, the choice is believe all of this, do it his way, strictly obey nine guys in upstate New York, or die. It's not much of a free will choice, now is it? If you believe that God is omniscient and omnipotent and that nothing comes about anywhere without his express design and purpose, then there can be nothing in all of creation that happens without being ordained by him. If, on the other hand, anything can exist or do anything apart from God's decree, then God, Jehovah, cannot be God. If you think about it, anything that comes to pass has already been known to Jehovah. 
if anything surprises Jehovah, then Jehovah is not sovereign, and he can't be God. In my opinion, you can scrap that whole radio dial or singing illustration and just move on. I'll share something really strange about me. I'm so intrigued with time and this concept and have reached so few conclusions that I seem to return to it a lot. And from the too much information department, this is going to be really weird, but I'm going to share it anyway. I have always wanted a room in my house dedicated to clocks. Yeah, it's been a thing with me since I was young. I always thought it would be fun to grow up and have a room where I just collected rare and intriguing clocks, sundials, all of it. And I would go into that room and I would sit there and let them all speak to me, hundreds of them. Nothing else in that room but the clocks just ticking away. Maybe a comfortable chair. And I wanted that room because I wanted to just sit and contemplate all things time. I'm so fascinated by it. I hope you are too. <laughs> and all of this reminds me of a scene from Back to the Future 3. If you haven't seen it, it's worth a look. It's a scene between Doc Brown, Marty McFly, and Jennifer Parker, his girlfriend. And Jennifer says, Doc Brown, I brought this note back from the future. And wow, now it's erased. And Doc Brown says to her, of course it's erased. And Jennifer says, well, but what does that mean? And Doc Brown says, it means your future hasn't been written yet. No one's has. Your future is whatever you make it. So make it a good one, both of you. If you're a Jehovah's Witness listening and thinking about leaving this organization or contemplating all that it entails, apparently, Jehovah already knows. Or apparently, he's choosing not to know. Either way, your future is what you make it. Make it a good one. I want to thank you all for listening. This is out of left field, and I appreciate your time wherever you may be. Be well.